We were in the sixth chapter of Judges last week, but I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 10th chapter first to remind you of Paul's statement after recounting some Israel history. So you keep this in mind as we read all of these things that happened to our forefathers in Israel. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Paul said of the history of Israel that he had just gone over, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And if there was any time in human history when God's Israel people need to understand the history of Israel and what God did with our forefathers, today is the day, now is the hour, this is the end of the age. So let's turn back where we were in the sixth chapter of Judges. We had read verses 4 and 5. I think we'll reread starting with verse 4. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. Now we're just beginning to see a time in America where we may be actually short of the physical necessities of life, partially because of our enemies who are taking them, using them up, sending them overseas, and so on. Verse 5, For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Now, recent disclosures, and by recent I mean within the last year, by Paul Harvey and John Rarick and Paul Scott, Paul Harvey and Paul Scott writing in the news media, and John Rarick putting this in the congressional record, indicate that over 20 million people have come to America in the last 25 years who are not of our Saxon race. In other words, these are people who are non-white, they're either colored, Asiatic or Jewish, and um, about five to eight million of them are Jews, and most of those are what we would know as the Khazar Jews of Eastern Europe, the Canaanite Jews coming to America from Europe. Paul Harvey, in an article about a year ago, stated that America has about six million people living in America illegally. In other words, they're aliens who have come in illegally, and many of them are on welfare. It was recently disclosed that uh, the lady who was in Nixon's cabinet runs some sort of a business out in California, and her political opponents put out the information that she actually had Mexicans on her payroll who were here illegally. And lo and behold, we discovered that there is no law against hiring people who are here in America illegally. So they can come here and get a job, and until someone actually puts the finger on that person, they stay here. So Paul Harvey estimated that there are as many as six million of them. Most of them are on welfare, except for the Jews who are here illegally. And, of course, they are doctors and lawyers and judges and crooked businessmen, and more dangerous than that, many of them are have gone into the political field and into the teaching in our schools. So they're professors in our schools, and they're also politicians. Now I want to read an old warning about the invasion of the United States of America by aliens. And this is about 145 years ago now, by the way, because this was written by Noah Webster about the time that he put out this original dictionary. And this is a copy of Noah Webster's Dictionary of 1828. We have them available here. And uh, the people who reprinted them have printed some articles about Noah Webster in the front part of the dictionary. And so uh, they say this about him. Wherever an individual wished to challenge his own ignorance or quench his thirst for knowledge... There, along with the Holy Bible and Shakespeare, were Noah Webster's slim and inexpensive spellers, grammars, readers, and his elements of useful knowledge containing the history and geography of the United States. 
Indeed, if his biblical name should have any significance to America, it might be said that Noah's books were an ark in which the American Christian spirit rode the deluge of rising anti-Christian and anti-Republican waters which threaten so often to inundate the nation. The first such tide came during the 1790s when apostles of the French Revolution at home and abroad imported a subversive doctrine to these shores in a series of historical and political articles published in his American Minerva magazine Noah Webster endeavored to educate the American public to the dangers inherent in Jacobinism. Now, if you don't know who the Jacobites were, they were, in effect, the Jewish revolutionists in France who brought about, eventually, the revolution of 1789 in France and the overthrow of the monarchy. And so Noah Webster is warning of this influence coming to America, and he wrote this in about 1790. Quote, I consider as a matter of infinite consequence the cautious admission of foreigners to the rights of citizenship. Numbers of them who have within the past year arrived and settled in this city come with violent prejudices against arbitrary government, and they seem to make no great distinction between arbitrary government and a government of laws founded on free elections. Many of them are warm Democrats. And the Emigration Society here is headed by Democrats of our own. In short, the opposers of our government are literally wriggling themselves into all sorts of company to carry their points. One main article of their policy is to attach foreigners to their principles the moment of their landing. If that system of creating a popular interest extraneous from the legislature to influence their proceedings, that system of raising a multitude of isolated private clubs over the nation as its guardian, should spread through the country, we may bid adieu to our Constitution. Our safety is in the country people, who more scattered and more independent are out of reach of the demagogues. In other words, in 1790, which is now over 180 years ago, Noah Webster warned that aliens coming here with philosophies opposed to our republican government would destroy our constitution. Now along with that I have a newspaper article from the Phoenix Gazette of yesterday. This is Saturday, August 18th, 1973. So this is a long time after Noah Webster warned us of what would happen. And this is an article which we find in here every so often titled, 43 Sworn In as New Citizens of the United States. And it lists all of their names and the countries of origin. There are 43 of them. They come from Canada, China, Costa Rica, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Ireland, Korea, Mexico, Netherlands, Pakistan, Philippines, and Poland. And out of the 43, 24 of them are from what we would call non-white nations, Plus, of the two from Great Britain, one of them is named Janet Ling Yi, and she is Chinese. About eight of them are from China, and apparently this is from mainland China. So over half of the people who took their citizenship oath this last week here in this city are aliens to our race. Now those are people who are here legally. Another newspaper article from July 31st to headlines... U.S. to speed entry of 800 Russian Jews. And the article says that this is 800 Russian Jews who are in Rome. They've come from the Soviet Union, and the Attorney General has issued an order granting them visas and the usual waiting period of several months for conditional entrance for refugees will be slashed to a few days, the Justice Department says. In other words, the Justice Department is actually violating the laws of the nation in order to bring hundreds, and as we know from other sources, thousands of these Eastern European Jews into America. We were warned by one of the greatest Christian men that came out of the early United States of America that these aliens coming to America would eventually destroy our Constitution because they did not believe and did not have the philosophies and principles of a Christian republic. All right, 
Let's reread verse 5 and 6. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. Now it's reached the point in America where the illegal ones and the ones coming in illegally who are non-Israelites are literally without number. We don't know how many there are. When Paul Harvey wrote that there were six million, he admitted in his article it was just a guess. Who knows? No one knows how many are here. And they entered into the land to destroy it, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And as I read the rest of this, you remember the reason for this, because if there is one thing I want to impress our people, the reason for all this happening is the same reason that these people went into captivity then. Verse 1, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. God is actually, I sincerely believe, allowing America to be invaded by hundreds of thousands, literally millions, of non-Israelites. And as Paul Harvey pointed out, Practically all of the Negro and colored immigrants go immediately on welfare. They go immediately on welfare. In fact, some years ago, one of the um, assistants to President Kennedy was uh, revealed as owning an airline. And the airline consisted of some old beat-up C-47s and other planes sold by the airlines as they converted to jets. And he was using them to fly round trip Puerto Rico to New York. $75 a head. Any Puerto Rican, and they're all colored, who could pay $75 was put on the plane in Puerto Rico, hauled to New York, and this included his bus fare from the airport to the New York welfare office. And they went right down there, signed up, and went right on welfare. And by the way, uh, the Human Events article that revealed this also said they were registered as voters when they signed up for welfare, and then they signed up as voters. And of course, this became an additional part of the people who then voted in the Jews who have taken over completely the government of New York City and the surrounding area. So these colored people are an invading army that is serving to do what? to impoverish God's Israel in America. So now we're going to read about what Israel did. Now you think, did these people at that time go out and organize the uh, John Birch Society and the Billy James Hargis Christian Crusade and the Carl McIntyre's 20th Reformation Hour and complain to each other how badly they were being treated and how these communists that were coming in were taking over the country? No, no. Praise the Lord, they did not. In verse 6 it says, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So praise the Lord. They did the only thing that they could do that would bring any results to take them out from this situation of captivity and bondage that they were in. In verse 7, It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord delivered them from captivity. No, not quite. He did something else first, which I believe is very, very important. That the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, And I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. In other words, the first answer by God to the cry of the children of Israel was not to send deliverance, but to send a prophet who told them who they were, what God had done for them, and that they were in captivity because ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. Now I wonder if it is not possible that God is raising up churches and ministries in America today 
to go out and preach this message to America to prepare America for the Gideon who will come. Everyone who knows something about the communist conspiracy, who understands the captivity we are under from the money system, and sees the possibility of shortage of food and the other physical necessities of life, most of them are looking for deliverance, some way out of this thing. And I believe that many of them are actually praying for America's deliverance. But God didn't send Gideon first. God sent the prophet to tell them that, and I wonder if that is not the message for America today, just as our people begin their cry to the Lord. No, they're not all crying. The whole nation isn't crying to the Lord. A lot of them don't even know they're in captivity. But I think it's about time that the prophets of God told the people in America that they are the redeemed of the Lord, that they are the descendants of the Israel people who were brought out of bondage in Egypt, that God brought us to this North American continent from Europe. He drove out the heathen before us, and he gave us this good land. And what happened? We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. In other words, we need the same message today for our people as our people begin to cry about the bondage that God sent the prophet to tell Israel of old when they cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Now, I don't believe that this message is going to mean an awful lot to the people who are not crying unto the Lord. In other words, the so-called right-wing conservatives who are crying to each other and complaining in their meetings and by their speakers and in their books, that all we've got to do is get rid of the Midianites and we'll be okay. That isn't what God said. You notice? The prophet in effect here, as far as, and I realize, verse 7 through 10, is very short. I wouldn't be surprised, but this prophet spent quite a bit of time preaching this message, not just those few words. But you notice the prophet didn't say a thing about how wicked the Midianites were, or how lazy they were, or how much they used up on welfare, or how many of them were eating the food out of the Israel land, didn't say a thing about them. His entire rebuke was to the children of Israel. Now I know as a preacher, in the present situation, that we have to explain to many people how we are being impoverished, how we are being invaded. But the major part of our message must be the same thing to the children of Israel. I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of your captors. And I brought you into this good land. And I told you not to pay any attention to the gods of the heathen, but you've not obeyed my voice. This same newspaper from yesterday has an article about Far Eastern, or they call them Eastern religions, giving the names of a number of so-called Indian teachers in America who have, each of them apparently, several hundred thousand to several million followers. False religions inside this nation of Israel just as there must have been back in old Israel, because God said, I told you, fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So, our people are believing false doctrine, even in their Christian churches. They are being taught a false Christ. They are being taught that they are the Gentiles, they are not an Israel people and that their God is going to come and snatch them off the earth and leave the earth to the Antichrist. Now, if the doctrine they're taught is not the doctrine of the Bible or the God of the Bible, what are they doing? They are worshiping another Jesus, another God, just as God accused these people of worshiping another God back in that day. Now, let's read some of the beginnings of some of the prophets. To prove my point, 
that the prophets to Israel, their main message was to tell Israel, Israel, you have sinned. Turn with me to the first chapter of Isaiah. And I want to read these because as we go along here, we're going to see that there is, at least right now, no Gideon to see. Isaiah chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Does that sound like it could fit the Anglo-Saxon people in America today? Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Turn with me to Jeremiah, the first chapter of Jeremiah. The first part of this chapter is the call of Jeremiah to be a prophet of the Most High. And then in verse 15 and 16, For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. What was... Jeremiah called to prophesy to tell them, The enemies are coming against the children of Israel. And I will utter my judgment against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. Jeremiah was a prophet raised up by God. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and what did he have to tell them? You have sinned, you have turned away from God, you have worshipped other gods. I am going to send a nation against you to punish you. Turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the second chapter. And this is the first part of it where he gets into the gist of Ezekiel's message to the house of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. This is always the message of the prophet. The prophet doesn't go to the children of Israel and say, Do you know what the Babylonians said? Or do you know what the communists said? Do you know what so-and-so said? No, the prophet's major message is, Say to the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And I think this is perhaps true. Even those who refuse to hear The call of the prophet, the call of God to repentance, they know they've had the call. And I think that's why Paul says they are without excuse. They all have heard. Turn to Hosea, who was sent to the northern house of Israel just before God sent them into the Assyrian captivity. Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So Hosea was a prophet contemporary with Jeremiah. Jeremiah went to the southern kingdom, and Hosea went to the northern kingdom. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, And the Lord said to Hosea, Take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. What was the message that God had to send through the prophet Hosea? That Israel had gone a-whoring after other gods. And I do not believe that many of our identity people recognize the truth 
that millions upon millions upon millions of professing Christians attend churches where another doctrine, another gospel, and another Jesus is preached. If you attend a church where the minister preaches that your God, Jesus Christ, is going to come and take you off from the earth before some great Antichrist comes, you are actually worshiping another God. Now this is serious business. I think too many of our identity people who have been given the light of God's Word and the understanding that we are Israel, we are in tribulation, we are not going to be raptured off from the earth, that our God is going to come here and save us and set up His kingdom here, we have been given this light and truth and we make the mistake of thinking that these people who worship a God they call Jesus Christ, but everything they believe about Him is false, we think they are worshiping the God of Israel. No, they are worshiping another God whose doctrine, his philosophy, his theology, everything is different. And so I think America today, Christendom today, is exactly like Israel of old. We are committing whoredom. And we're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. People go to churches and they call upon Jesus Christ and they name their churches, Christian churches. And their preacher teaches and they believe. All false doctrines. Is that worshiping God? God forbid. Turn to Amos. In chapter 3, before he goes in with his message to the house of Israel, Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Would to God we could get this message across to our people. God says, I'm going to punish Israel for their iniquities. Yes, I know. We're under the new covenant. Yes, I know. The blood of Jesus has redeemed us from our iniquities. But every time you read the message of the prophet... Even the message of John the Baptist was what? Repent, repent, repent. In other words, turn from your wicked ways, turn from your disobedience, and turn to the Lord God Almighty. Then you will have His mercy. This idea that we're going to have the mercy of God while we're still in disobedience is not scriptural. God is going to turn us, of course, with chastisement. Turn to Micah. Chapter 1, the word of the Lord which came to Micah the Morishite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all ye people, and hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountain shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be cleft, as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Why? For the transgression of Jacob is all this. Why was God going to come down and visit these calamities upon Israel? For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? And remember, you have to realize and remember that Samaria was where Jeroboam had set up the golden calves. They were worshiping false gods in the capital city of the northern house of Israel. And that's why he says the transgression of Jacob is Samaria. Therefore I will make Samaria as in heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. God said, I'm going to destroy your land, because you're worshiping false gods in Samaria and in Jerusalem. Now, I won't read the next two here for time, but Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 is the same story. 
Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, is the same story. And you turn with me to Haggai, because I think Haggai's warning is enough and fits the United States of America and our people so explicitly that I think we'd better study it a little further. Haggai is after the prophet Zephaniah and before Zechariah, about 10 or 12 pages before the end of the Old Testament. And as I read this, you think with me because I believe that the prophets who are going to be sent to the house of Israel today are not going to be new prophets with new visions. I think they're going to be men who are going to be able to bring the message of the old prophets. The message of the old prophets. Now I have made some rather derogatory remarks about men who come today and they say, oh, I had a vision of California falling into the sea. And they go to California and they tell all these people about California falling into the sea. And it doesn't come to pass. And it has not come to pass. One man said this was going to happen in 1969. didn't happen. I do not believe those are the kind of prophecies that are going to turn the children of Israel today. I think it's going to be the prophecies that are already written in God's Word. All right, here's Haggai, and I believe these prophets are going to have to come before we have our Gideon deliverance. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. That's quite an accusation if you stop and think what they were saying. In effect, they were saying it's not time for the kingdom. It's not time for the Lord's house. We have all these other things to do. It's not time for God's house. And this is the first accusation. Now today... The vast majority of our Israel people who do not go to church don't even know what the kingdom is. So they're not looking for God to build His kingdom. Most of the people who do go to church are being told it's not time for the kingdom because first of all we have to have the rapture of the Christians and they're going to go spend three and a half years, seven years or eternity in heaven and then come back and build God's kingdom. So they're saying... The time has not come that the Lord's house should be built. And this is the first rebuke, and then God rebuked them further. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? What do you mean by spending all of your money building up your own houses and your own businesses, and spending it on yourself while God's house lies waste. Now, sealed houses in the Hebrew means a mansion. The effect of this is saying that you're spending all your money on yourself, and you're not giving it to the building of God's house or God's kingdom. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And the margin of this says, set your heart on your ways. You stop and turn and look at what you're doing. Consider your ways. Verse 6. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. You do a lot of planning and preparing and working and scheming and nothing results from it. You buy for your food, your clothing, and for your house, and you never have enough. He says you even earn wages, and you earneth these wages to put them into a bag with holes. Now, you people don't do that, do you? You certainly don't take your money that you earn from working 
and then carry it around in a pocket that has a hole in it or a bag that has a hole in it and lose it all over the country. Do you? Or do you? Take a look at the check stub that you get from your employer. I've listed some holes here. Here's hole number one, federal income tax withholding. Hole number two, social security withholding. Hole number three, your hospitalization insurance. Hole number four, perhaps you have a pension fund they withdraw from your salary. Hole number five, state income tax. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have some more holes. And God is saying through the prophet to old Israel, well, you foolish people, you try to do all of these things for yourselves and look what is happening because of what you're doing. You can't get results from your planning and your scheming. And even the wages that you earn, you put them in a bag full of holes. And hole number six, I forgot this one, which is perhaps one of the largest ones, is the usury interest you pay on your mortgages, on your homes, and on your cars and your charge accounts and so on. The average family of four or five in America today who own their own homes pay a minimum of a thousand dollars a year in interest, and many of them pay as much as three and four thousand dollars out of their fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars earnings of the husband and wife. That's a pretty good sized hole, wouldn't you say? And these people back in that day must have been suffering from the same situation. God repeats. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. A man could preach a whole sermon on that verse 6 of Haggai, couldn't he? And I think that message of Haggai, of course, is the message we preach today when we talk about the money system and how our people are being oppressed economically. Now, Haggai did it all in one little verse there, but we, of course, have to spend more time for our people to understand. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build the house. In other words, you go and prepare and do those things for the house of God. You go up to the mountain. Now you know the word mountain is used in the scripture many times in relation to the kingdom of God. What did Christ say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. Now here he's saying you go up to the mountain. I believe he says you get your hold on the kingdom and bring wood and build the house. He's not talking about their house. He's talking about the house of God that he referred to back in verse 2. And I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. But you don't do it so... Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. And uh, the margin of my Bible says that could have been translated, I blow it away. I have heard stories from people. In fact, I can tell you this myself. And before I learned to tithe, and I've heard the same story from other people before they learned to tithe, that it seems as if they always had every week or every month a car repair bill, something happened to the plumbing, some equipment in the house broke down, cost them $75 to get it fixed, or they had to have a tooth fixed, cost them $150, or someone got hurt and they had to go to the doctor and it took $35. And it finally began to dawn on them over the years that all the money they should have been giving to the house of the Lord, God blew it away anyway. And it was gone. And people tell me, after they learned to tithe, that they discovered that the 90% they kept paid all of their bills and they had money left over, even if it was not more money. I remember the man who arranged to move us from Minnesota down here to Arizona. And when he found out I was a preacher, of course, he had to talk. He was a Christian. And if I recall, the only thing he told me was he had learned to tithe the hard way. He was a salesman. He used to make a lot of money. And he was not tithing. And he said, you know, I went to church and I professed to believe. 
And he said, it took me several years before I realized why I was learning less and less every year. And he said, God finally brought my income down to where it fit my tithe. That's right. And he was serious about it. God reduced his income to fit his, what he was paying the church. Well, then when he learned, he started paying the church the 10% of whatever it was he earned, and then his income went back up. But he learned the hard way that God actually blows it away. Now, this is the message of Haggai to the children of Israel when they're in rebellion. Why do you build your sealed houses? Why do you spend all your money on yourself and you won't build the house of God? Verse 7, he said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He said that twice in there. In other words, you people of Israel, you turn and think about what it is you are doing. I know it's wonderful, isn't it, to sit around by the hour and talk about what the communists are doing. Now, the house of Israel was in rebellion just before the Assyrian captivity when Haggai came to them and he didn't say a word about what the Assyrians were planning to do to the house of Israel. He said, Israel, you consider your own ways. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you bought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? In other words, why does God blow away or cause the Christian people to spend the money they should have given to God's work, and why does he blow it away? Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. How about that? You thought the prophet was going to come to the children of Israel here and tell them that, well, you're supposed to get back and obey God's laws, statutes, and judgments, you're supposed to put the murderers to death and the rapists to death and you're supposed to attend church every so often and you're supposed to do such and so. And here this prophet has a message that is nothing more nor less than telling them you're not giving of your earnings to the house of God. That's why God blows away your earnings. That's why he allows this tremendous income tax. That's why he allows all of these other things to steal your money from you. Now, I have Pastor Ewing's tract here on the law of tithing in Scripture. And Pastor Ewing says something here that I think all of you who are opposed to the high taxes under the federal income tax should read and consider. And here's what he says after talking about man-made governments. But the tithe still belongs to God. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And he quotes the sources, gives the sources of that. The extra tax exacted by governments of our day is the penalty we pay for not accepting God's rule over us nationally. Israel was told of this very thing when she demanded a king to become like the other nations that he, the king, would misappropriate the tithe. Yes, your government is actually taking the money from you that you should have given to the house of God. And if you'd given it to the house of God, as a people and as a nation, your government wouldn't be robbing and plundering you the way they are. Let's go on just a little further in time here. Verse 10, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth. In other words, God reduced the productivity of the children of Israel. He reduced the things they were producing in the land. Do you see the parallel to America today? I believe God is actually blowing upon the whole nation reducing the things that we have, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands. God calls for this, and God is doing this in America today. I believe the scripture in Luke 12 applies to those of you who know we are the Israel people. And I'm just going to use my own area as an example. I would guess that there are at least 100 families 
in this Phoenix area who know the truth of the Israelite identity and what God is doing with us. I doubt if 20 of them tithe to the work of the kingdom. Now how in the world can we expect the rest of the nation to turn when we, as God's people who have been given this knowledge, do not do the first thing that Haggai tells us, you take care of God's house first. Then you worry about your own. And I believe Christ stated a principle here in Luke 12, which fits us. Verse 47 and 48. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. These people who don't know what we know are not going to be punished in the manner that we should be or may be. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask more. We have been given more in light and understanding and comfort from the Scriptures than any other people. God help us to obey the very simple thing of taking care of God's house. Now that's as far as we're going today. That's one of the messages that is going to have to be taught to the house of Israel from the prophets that God is going to send before we get to Gideon. You didn't know there was a message about tithing in the story of Gideon, did you? But it's got to come before Gideon's release comes to us. Let's all stand. Our Father and our God, we pray for thy mercy. We pray, Lord, that you will turn us. Help us obey. Help us to see and understand that you are chastising Jacob to turn us back to thee. It's for our good because of thy mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.